Take a minute to pray for our missionaries here this evening. Lord, thank you for the work being done in the Philippines, and it's good to hear these uh, these uh, updates. It's good to hear how the work is, how you're um, carrying out your work through being able to preach at a young people's get together for two days, being able to baptize some new believers, um, being able to acknowledge students as we as we have come to an end of a uh, school year and ready to head into a new school year now. Thank you for the work that the church and the, the gospel and the truth being brought into the center of, of lives. And so thank you for what you're doing here in our uh, ministry and in our fellowship as you continue to grow us and you use us in the work that's before us. And we pray that you'll bless the work of our hands and thank you for the work the Tangles are doing in the Philippines. We pray you'll bless Victory Bible Baptist Church and the, and the ministry there. Uh, it's a great work when we think about our missionaries wherever they are. And we've been blessed to have some come through this year. And we look forward to the work continuing until you come uh, this year ahead of us. May we be faithful about the Father's business and whatever it is. And your kingdom work being carried out. We pray for each other. We head into a new week. And we have no idea what's coming. But we're glad to turn our eyes towards you. And, and we're glad to be able to pray for each other. We wrote some things down. And so we ask that you'll go with us that you'll lead through everything that's coming and that your grace would be at work and, and carrying us through. Thank you for that promise that your grace is sufficient and your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you for your word. What a wonderful opportunity again. Anytime we have to, to, to grow in the, in the truth so that our faith can be built up is a wonderful privilege and we look forward to what you have for us as we open up the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's open our Bibles. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, there's a context to these familiar verses. I, I hope they're familiar to us. That's a good thing. When I say familiar verses, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And getting the truth in relation to those familiar verses is the way that God speaks, the way that God works, and the way that God directs us. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's living and, and, and powerful and powerful. So as we come tonight to 1 John chapter 2, we're familiar. The familiar verses I'm referencing are verses 15 through 17. There's a context, though. We're going to start in verse 12 for our study. For 1 John 2, verses 12 through 17. But even that's the broader context. And that's, I keep wanting to lay that foundation as we continue through the, the books of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. We're in 1st John. We can know the truth in these last days of apostasy and false teaching. This is a different approach to God telling his people about the false teaching and apostasy that's all around us. The different approach is that you can know the truth and have confidence in these last things. There's another approach to the apostasy and false teaching, and that's be aware, don't listen to it, know what's right, and, and, and don't go anywhere near the wrong, and fight against it. And we'll get to that in Jude. Jude actually tells us, earnestly contend for the faith. But 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is all about knowing the truth so that we have a solid foundation to stand on in these days when truth is completely ignored, right? So we can know the truth in these last days of apostasy and false teaching. The truth is centered in a person. It's centered in Jesus, right? In Him, we have a solid foundation that cannot be shaken. How, how do we start our study of 1st John? We have fellowship with God. We have the joy of the Lord. These things are right. You might have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Son. And that your joy might be full. So what does he say then in the first parts of 1 John? Walk in the light and deal with sin. Remember that? Confess our sin. That's how we'll continue to, to walk in the truth. Number two, keep God's commands. That's what we looked at last time. Keep God's commands. That's how we'll assure our hearts before God. Because we're keeping it. We love to keep God's commands. We want to walk in God's way. This evening, we're challenged to love God with all our heart. And that's the connection to verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, verse 15. In other words, if you're going to be standing firm on the truth and, and knowing God in these last days, you're going to love God and set your affection on things above. Remember, as I prayed to begin, these thoughts were in my mind as we began here this evening. That's the perspective that the believer has. Our attention, our focus is fixed on heaven. We are looking for the things to come. 
And our love is not on this world and its things. Our love is on God, and that sets us apart, and it puts us in a different direction. So this evening, we're challenged to love God with all our heart. The world's always in front of us. Satan is constantly using the world to draw us away from God. But we can overcome the world by loving God. And look at verse 15 again. If any, at the end, if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what God wants us to be filled with, the love of God. Loving him with all our heart. We can stand firm. Now here's where we just make the application of the context. We can stand firm in these last days if we're letting a love for God fill our hearts instead of a love for this temporary, passing, fading world. That's what's going to keep us firm. That's what's going to keep us pressing toward the mark. Because we love God and we're, and we're saying no to the world. So let's be challenged this evening to love God more than anything else. As I say that, getting into our study, what did Jesus, what did Jesus say to Peter there as he was out fishing once again after Jesus had risen from the dead? And Peter thought there was no point in serving Jesus because he had denied him. And what did Jesus ask him? Lovest thou me more than thee? And I'm of the opinion that that reference was to the fish. Peter, you're going to just give your life for that which is not going to last, or are you going to serve me with your life? So, loving God, as we look together at this more than anything else, let's start, number one, at, with an encouraging reminder. This is so neat how he starts in verse 12. Look at what he does in verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers. Okay, so all of a sudden we're starting to see a... a, a, a a separation, a segregation, if you will, a, a, a difference between some groups because you have known him that is from the beginning. And here's the third group. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Now he goes right back through it. Look, look at what it is. He goes right back through it. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Wow. And by the way, there is a clear connection because it, all that is in the world, verse 16, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that's the work of Satan. And so he says, you've overcome the wicked one. Well, that's why I put number one as an encouraging reminder. John is writing to God's people, and he wants to encourage them in their walk with God, and he breaks them down into groups. Three different categories, if you will. He's writing to every believer to encourage them that they can overcome. They can love God, even though the world is so tempting, even though the world has it claims it has a lot to offer. Notice that. It claims it has a lot to offer, <laughs> but it's really just dust and ashes. We can overcome. So he, he breaks it down. Did you notice the three groups, little children? Those who are still growing in their walk with God. By the way, that's John's favorite term for the church as he writes this letter. Little children. It comes up, you'll notice it now after we look at it tonight. It comes up in almost every other verse. It doesn't, it? but it just seems like it. That's his favorite phrase to describe God's people. Little children. That term of endearment and care that comes from God to that, that child that needs his direction, right? So that's the first group, little children who are still growing in their walk with God. Then he writes to the young men. You can see that picture. They're fighting the good fight of faith. They're being strong in the Lord. They're up there on the front lines. And then he writes to the fathers, the third group, aged believers with wisdom and knowledge to pass on to others. And by the way, it takes all three as God does his work amongst his people. There should be those new believers that are growing in their faith. There should be those fathers that are, what does it say in Titus? The aged women teach the younger women. The aged men teach the young men. There should be those fathers who can come along and help those little children grow in their walk with God. And then there should be those young men. See, this is the Bible's picture. There should be those, those in that stage of their walk with God and in their lives where God has them out there doing his work on the front line. So this is interesting, an encouragement, an encouraging reminder as John says, I want to encourage each one of you, wherever you're at, see this is the thought, in your walk with God, I want to encourage you to overcome. Now as we look at this, this one last thought, but each believer had started the journey somewhere. Where, did each believe, where does each believer start the journey of faith? It starts with Jesus. It starts by repentance of sin and 
putting our faith and trust in Jesus. That's where the little children become the people of God, the, 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 the sons of God. That's where the young men are growing and being strong because they, they know Jesus as their Savior. That's where the fathers are able to teach others because they've grown in their love for Jesus because he saved them. Each believer, even though we break it up into three categories, had to start with Jesus. That's where the journey starts. And John wanted them to continue walking with God. So he talks to the little children first in verse 12. I read unto you, little children, what does he say? Because your sins are forgiven you, for his name's sake. So skip down to the end of verse 13. I read unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. John speaks to the little children as those who have their sins forgiven. This is where life starts in Jesus. We must know that our sins are forgiven. You can see this clearly, can't you? Little children, all right, here's where it, you started. Your sins are forgiven. Where does it lead? The end of verse 13. Now you've known the Father. In other words, now you're a child of God. Your sins have been forgiven. Now you're a part of the family of God. God is your Father. Every new believer is born again into the family of God. How does that happen? Are you, are you following along? Because their sins were forgiven. And they've been made new creatures in Christ. So let me read this to you. Every new believer gives testimony to the truth of having their sins forgiven. Every new believer. And it's a joyful thing, isn't it? It's wonderful to hear the testimony of new believers talking about how God forgave them of their sin and gave them new life. It's wonderful. It's a blessing. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. In my mind, as I was studying this, the blind man, he was so excited. Once, I don't know about this Jesus. All I know is once I was blind, now I see. That's, that's the testimony. This is the joy of new life. In Jesus, the joy of the new believer. And so at the end of verse 13, now they know the Father. Isn't that interesting? Now they have a Father in heaven. The little children are now in a relationship with God as their Father. They're born again. They're in a family of God. They're rejoicing in this new relationship with God as they're filled with the love of God and, and this heart of a new believer. This is the heart of a new believer. They're rejoicing in God as their Father. So John reminds the little children of their salvation and life in God. Now you know the Father. It's interesting in the verses, he goes from the little children to the fathers. And I think that's, he's trying to make that connection. Remember the little children, you know, come alongside them and help them. But we're going to go to the next one in order, and that would be the young men, the middle of verse 13. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. And then down to the, to the middle of verse 14, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. The young men are the strong, growing, firm believers. These are the ones, if you get the picture here, on the front lines in the kingdom of God. These are the, so in my mind as I thought through this, these are the Timothys that Paul is getting ready to serve the Lord. These are the Joshuas that take over as Moses gets older. These are the Elishas. That take over for the older Elijah. So there's a place in the body of Christ for little children who are just, just, just saved and they're, they know the Father and, and it's just such exciting and they're growing and, and so we got to you know, help them and let them grow, keep, keep them growing. And then there's a place for the young men who are saying, I know what God's called me to do and, and while I have life, I'm going to serve the Lord. These are the young men who are standing up with the, with the others and saying, my life is about the Lord. And, and so think with me about this. What a waste. As we get to verses 15 through 17. What a waste for a young person to love the world and miss out on what God has for them. Isn't that that's sad? So you get to the end of verse 17. That's what the context is. Look at the end of verse 17. Or the whole verse 17. The world passeth away the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the young men are the ones, in this context, are the ones who said, I'm living for Jesus. I'm going to serve him. My life belongs to him. And I'm sure there were some around Paul and others that had, like Demas, forsaken the, the Lord and, and loved this present world. And that's sad. So the young men in the body of Christ are the faithful servants doing the work of the Lord. What does it say in verse 13? They've overcome the wicked one. They're strong in the Lord. They, these are the ones taking up the baton and running the race for the next section of God's work, for that next generation 
to keep doing the work of God. And how do they overcome the wicked one? Look at verse 14. I write unto the young men, because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So John gives us a little more insight into their strength. They're putting on the whole armor of God. They're standing in the evil day because the word of God is in them. John gives us insight into their strength. They're not strong in themselves. You know, think of Gideon. I can't do that. No, you can't, but the Lord will give you the strength to do it. We overcome Satan by God's strength. We must stand firm in God's word. That's how we're strengthened for the fight. We must live faithfully the truth of God's word. Victory is possible. We can be strong in the Lord. The little children, I like this, can grow to be strong in the Lord. The fathers can continue to be strong in the Lord because the word of God dwells in us. Verse 14, the word of God abideth in you. That's the key. It's the word of God that grows the little children. It's the word of God that the fathers are teaching. And it's the word of God that gives the young men strength to overcome the wicked. So John encourages this second group, the faithful soldiers of the cross, by reminding them that they are strong in the Lord. They've overcome Satan. And they'll continue to overcome him by the power of God. And then we get to that third group, the fathers. I, I think you can see it. I think you can see the progression. Little ones, little children, young men. And now we've got the fathers who are there as the, as the, the, the mature, that's what I wrote in my notes, the mature, knowledgeable leaders in the church. Where would the church of God be without this uh, atmosphere of those older believers who have walked the journey, served the Lord, and they're able to be those pillars in the church today? Where would, where would the church be? The, the, so verse 13 is where they first show up. I run into you fathers because, and I think this is interesting, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. So again, in verse 14, I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. He repeats it. The key to the older faithful believer is that they know God. Isn't that interesting? What's supposed to happen? What is supposed to be a reality in my life if I'm growing in the Lord? What's supposed to happen? I'm supposed to know more about God. That's what's supposed to happen. The little children who grow in their knowledge of God, become young men who are able to overcome the wicked one because they know God and they're walking with God in the power of the Lord. And they then become the fathers who have the wisdom of God because they know more about God. Where does wisdom come from? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The older believer, the fathers, know God in a fuller way because of their time of walking with God. All of us should be growing in our knowledge and understanding of God. We should all be able to be at a place one day when we know more. The fathers are in that place. They know God. And now they can share that with the little children and with the young men. They can be those encouragers. John has written to them, the fathers, to encourage them in their continual learning. That's the reference in verse 14. I have written unto you because ye have known. So keep learning. And by the way, it's that past tense. I have written. So look at what's written and keep, keep growing. Keep your eyes on the Lord. John's telling the fathers that he has written to keep the fathers focused on God. That's, see, that's what I just said. Keep your eyes on God. Don't, don't. It's easy to get distracted as we become familiar with the truth. We can quit on God. We can throw in the towel and start to live for this world. But John encourages the fathers and their knowledge of God. So this is where we make application of these verses. What group do we fit in? What, what category do we find ourselves in? And we're not talking about age, obviously. We're talking about those that are, those that are uh, just brought into the body of Christ and faith in Jesus. And they're little children that are learning and growing and letting God teach them. Are we in that group of the young men that are out there on the front lines and saying, God, what have you called me to do? What's my part in this work of faith or are we in that generation, that section of the fathers that are able to share and encourage and instruct others in their walk with God. But the, the application is John is writing to all three groups of believers because all three have a responsibility. Press on. John's excited about the new believers who have their sins forgiven and know the Father. He doesn't want them to, to love the world. 
Keep loving God. He's excited about the work of the young men <clears throat> and how they're faithfully serving God. And he doesn't want them to leave the work like Demas. Keep loving God. And John's excited about the fathers and their knowledge that they can share. So John's encouraging them. Keep your love for God strong. There's a place and a work for each of us. There's a reality that God's doing. There's a work that God's bringing about in each of our lives. John doesn't want any of us to be pulled away from God by the work. So he does this encouraging reminder. Secondly, a forceful challenge. Love not the world. You see that in verse 15? Right away, right off the of what he just said. I write to you little children. I write to you young men. I write to you fathers. All of you. <laughs> he doesn't even introduce the verse. He just comes right out and says it. Love not the world. So these familiar verses have a clear challenge in this context. We will not continue to grow as little children, young men, and fathers if the world pulls us away. We will not be those fathers that can instruct the next generation if we're not loving God today. We won't be those young men that are overcoming the wicked one if we're overcome by the world. We won't be those little children that are loving the Father and, and enjoying our walk with Him if we're loving the world. We will not continue to serve God if the world pulls us away. We will not dwell in God's love if we're loving the world. So John warns us about the world and its things. There's, there are three main words that stand out in verses 15, 16, and 17. Verse 15, the word love. Look at verse 15. Love, not the world. These are the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The second point we're going to see is in verse 16. For all that is in the world... Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's the emphasis in verse 16. Don't, don't follow the world. And then the word in verse 17 is the will of God abiding forever, victory. But let's look at that first word in verse 15, love, our love. Jesus made it clear, Matthew chapter 6, that we cannot serve two masters. Jesus said you will either love the one and hate the other, hold to the one, despise the other, he cannot serve God and mammon. That's the Bible word, and that's the things of the world. Which is clearly what John's talking about in 1 John 2, verse 15. The world and all of its things, that's what we're going to look at in the second point, verse 16. We should not love, but we should not hold on to. You see how John is talking to believers uh, that... They can know the truth. They can stand firm in these days of apostasy and false teaching. The firm believer is not loving the world. We don't, we don't hold on to this world. It's not going to last. So John reminds us of verse, in verse 15 of what Jesus said. You can't love God and the world. That's the end of verse 15. The love of the Father is not in you if you're loving the world. It's not the love of the Father is in God doesn't love you. That's not what he's talking about. It's the love of the Father that you and I should have that's replaced by a love for the world. That's why verse 15 starts with love not the world. Instead, love God with all your heart. If the world has our love, then God does not. If the, wings of, if the things of the world hold our attention, then God does not hold our attention. So where's our focus? That's our affection, our attention. That's another thing Jesus said in Matthew 6. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the follower of Christ in relation to this world loves God and not the world. Doesn't mean we can't have the things of the world and we don't use the things of the world. It means we don't love them. Like we all understand that tonight. Love is where we put our heart. It's where we put our desire. If we love the world, our heart will be on the world and its things. If we love God, our heart will be on God and his things. In fact, just to finish Jesus' thought in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's where our love should be. Loving God with all our heart. That's how we'll be protected from, pulling, from being pulled away from God. The little children, the young men, the fathers need to keep their love for God strong. Love not the world. Let the love of God fill your heart. The challenge is to not love the world, and that's when he starts the picture in verse 16, for all that is in the world. And in these three areas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's not of the Father. That's of the world. So don't love the world and let those things control your life. Let the Father control your life. What are the things the world tempts us with? What are the desires, the affections that the, the world seeks to draw us away with? 
first of all, the lust of the flesh. That's following after what you want. It's letting the flesh tell us how to live. It's doing what feels good. Whether it's wrong or not, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to let the, the desires of the flesh control me. If I feel like doing it, I'm going to do it. God calls us to deny ourselves. That's what Jesus said. Deny yourself. God calls us to take up our cross, to die to ourselves. You cannot follow the lust of the flesh and God at the same time. That's, that's what he's warning us about. So don't let, don't, the world, for all that is in the world, and it, first of all, is the lust, that's how the, the world lives, following after the desires of the flesh. Secondly, it's the lust of the eyes. That's living by what looks good. By what feels good is the flesh. Now we're living by what looks good. Well, it looks okay. It, this is, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It just, it looks like it would be fun. It looks like it would be okay. And the world has a lot to offer. That looks good. There's a lot of glitter and light in the world. But you, you've heard this phrase, not everything that glitters is gold. We must not live by what we see. In fact, what does the Bible tell us to live by? Faith, setting our affection on things above, our focus, our attention on things above. If we're following after the lust of the eyes, then we're not following after God by faith. We're just going by what we see, by what we think looks good. So we have the lust of the flesh doing what feels good, the lust of the eyes doing what looks good. Well, I think it's okay. It looks okay to me. And then there's that pride of life, verse 16. The pride of life. I mean, I don't think that takes a lot to explain. Like the others. It does, I think we're just encouraging our hearts through thinking through it. The pride of life is it's all about me. That's the pride of life. Making life all about you and what you want. This is putting yourself first and making sure that you get what you want. Clearly. We cannot love God when we're loving ourselves. Clear. If we're living our lives based on the pride of life, on, the, on what I can do, what I can get, on what it's all about for me in the end, then we're not living our lives for God. Cannot live for self and God at the same time. So what does Paul say? Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live, it's Christ. That's how we should live. And then ultimately to die is gain, right? The world is not of God. Look at verse 16 again. All of this that is in the world, and it skipped down to the end, is not of the Father. If I'm going to have the love of God, verse 15, then I'm, I'm going to resist that lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. To know the Father and to love the Father is to deny the things of the world. That's not what I'm going to let control my life. My love for God is going to control me, not the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But the world's trying to pull us away from God. We must love God and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So, so what's verse 17? So 15, the emphasis is on where's your love? 16, the emphasis is on what, what does the world have to offer? 17, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Verse 17, we can clearly see that there's a victory for those that will say no to the world and yes to God. Again, I don't want to miss the context. We bring it back, just a real quick reminder here. Little children, young men, and fathers. It's so exciting what God's doing. Love not the world. Abide in his will, verse 17. John makes it clear that the world passes away. The world has nothing to offer that will last. Nothing to offer that will satisfy. The world is temporary, fleeting, and passing, and fading. So why love the world in its instant? Why lay up treasures, to quote Jesus again, on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves do break through and steal? The, the world is nothing over. It's not going to last. The world passes the way and the lust thereof. Why live for what doesn't last? The little children, the young men, and the fathers need to live for what will matter. What will last? And that's just, it's so neat at the end of verse 17. But he that doeth the will of God. That's why I read Micah 6 to begin with this evening. What doth the Lord require? But to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. I mean, we, I say it on purpose. It's not that complicated, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do. I'm just saying, God doesn't make the Christian life complicated. There's one word really that sums it up faith. <laughs> and then another word, love. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's not hard, but it is difficult. We must press on our walk with God. John would not say this under inspiration. John would not say this if there wasn't, if there wasn't that 
danger of the little children, the young men, and the fathers being pulled away because of the world. We must live for God and His things every day. It's the one who does the will of God that abides forever. That brings to mind Romans 12. I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The encouragement is that the one doing God's will abides forever. That's the encouragement. The world's going to pass, but if you're... What's that first song we say? I want to be faithful. I want to be true. That's what's going to matter. That's what John wants for the little children, the young men, and the fathers. A forceful challenge. Our victory is found in he that doeth the will of God. So, let's not be pulled away from God by the world. Loving God. That's the challenge. That, and again, you can see how if we're going to stand firm in these last days, it's going to be because our hearts are fixed on the things of God, on God and His things. And we're not going to be... Show me all the commercials you want. But I love God. There's nothing wrong with a new phone. But it's not what changes my life. I'm loving God. I'm living for God. That's where my heart is. And so that's how we'll stay firm in these last days. Let's not be pulled away from God by the world. Let's keep our eyes on God. Let's be faithful where we are in our walk with God. Little children, young men, fathers, right? Let's be faithful where we are. Loving God and not the world. Focusing on the things of God, the will of God. And abiding in God's love. Let's pray. Thank you, God. It's a wonderful challenge. A clear challenge. As John saw the church in these last days of apostasy, you can stand firm by loving God. Don't let the world love not the world. And we're glad to have that same challenge for us here this evening. Help us keep our focus on the things of God, the will of God, abiding in His love, so that we can be faithful about your business and doing what matters with our lives. And as always, Lord... <laughs> It's not about us. You get the glory. And that's how our lives are fruitful. So we pray that would be so as we love you, God, with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.